so here we go. Uh, this week, uh, we're going to go ahead and continue on the Sermon on Identity Wars. Now, the first week, if you missed the first week, we talked about the life of Moses. And in doing so, we talked about the difference between your identity versus your purpose. Your purpose is, on, is, is about everything in which God has called you to do, but your identity is birthed from who you are. And in order for you to have the inner fortitude to accomplish everything that God has called you to do in your purpose, you got to know who you are in your identity. The people who do not know who they are in their identity, they will fail when it comes to accomplishing the purposes of God in their life because your purpose is very hard. It's filled with fiery trials. It's filled with pressure. It's filled with pain. It's filled with hardship. But you know in your heart God's called you to do something, but when the pressure comes, if you don't know who you are, you won't have the strength to withhold or to withstand the fiery trials that come with that. And so your identity comes from answering this question, who am I? Everybody say, who am I? It comes with answering that question of who am I? And if you want to know the answer to who I am, just like Moses, when God called Moses to the purpose of delivering God's people out of slavery into the promised land, he couldn't do it because he didn't know who he was. And so he asked God, who am I? And that's when the Lord revealed his name in Exodus 3 for the very first time in Scripture. He didn't reveal it in Genesis. He revealed it in Exodus. And he says, what is your name, God? And he says, my name is a verb. It's not a person, place, or thing. My name is a verb. My name is the I am. And if you want to know who you are, you need, a, you need the revelation of who God is. And God says, I am, and that will be my name for all generations. And then obviously Jesus came, and he said, I am the bread of life. I am the vine. All right? I am the good shepherd. And so Jesus embellished that name of the I am. Last week we looked at the life of Peter. And Jesus asked Peter the identity question. Who do men say that I am? This is Jesus asking a question. And Peter said, some say this, some say that. And he says, okay, what about you, Peter? What about you, Simon? Who do you say that I am? And he said, well, you're Christ. You're the son of the living God. And then Jesus turned to Simon and said, blessed are you, Simon, for flesh and blood and what you've heard on the news reports about me has not revealed this to you. But my Father in heaven has revealed it to you. And because my Father in heaven has revealed to me, to you, who I am, I am now going to change your identity so you know who you are. In fact, now you are going to be Peter. You're going to be Peter. And you're going to be a rock. You're going to be a rock. And you're going to partner and mobilize with me the first generation of the church that I established here on earth. You see, if you, want the, if you want to know who you are, you need to have the revelation first of who God is. Again, it's all about who am I. Using the analogy of this glove, we talked about this. Okay? So here's my hand. And pretend like this is me as a person. All right? And... I am naked, I am ashamed, I am filled with sin, I have issues, I have no covering. But when I look at Christ, who represents this glove, he is the righteousness of God, he is light, he is holy, he is love, he is kind, he is joy, he is good, he's all of these things, right? And if you want to know who you are, you need to know and have the revelation of who God is because once when you find out who God is and you believe in him and turn to him, he, what happens? He covers you, but not only does he cover you, now you are hidden in Christ. Your identity is who you are in Christ. In Christ, it's who you are. So in Christ right now, if we can put up the slide up there, in Christ, I am lavished with love. In Christ, in Christ, I am wonderfully made in God's image, right? In Christ, I am forgiven. In Christ, I am cleansed. In Christ, I am called. I am forgiven. I am chosen, right? I am cleansed from all unrighteousness. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I am holy. I am blameless. I am dead to sin and alive to God. I am free. 
This is all of the aspects of who I am in Christ. I'm a co-heir with Christ. I'm the salt of this earth. I am a minister of reconciliation. I am an ambassador of Christ. I am a temple of God. I am more than an overcomer. I am able to do all things through Christ who strengthens me because it's who I am in Christ. Without Christ, you get none of it. You want your purpose in God, but you need to know who you are in God. And so we got to be a church that familiarizes ourselves with the revelation of who God is so we can have the revelation understanding of who we are in Christ. And it all comes down to your spiritual identity. It comes to your spiritual identity. You are who God declares you to be according to his word if you believe in Jesus. It's who you are in Christ. Everybody say in Christ. And so this week, I want to talk about why we so easily forget our spiritual identity. You see, I can be preaching to you right now and not even realize I'm in Christ. I can be going to work and doing things and meeting with people on the side, and I forget I'm in the glove. I forget that I'm in Christ. Why is it that we so easily forget who we are in Christ? And so in order to answer this question... We're going to have to continue looking at the life of Peter and why when he was faced under the pressure of the culture to conform to its ways, he not only forgot his identity in Christ, totally forgot it, but he ended up denying Christ. He ended up denying Christ. If you remember, way before Simon Peter even entered into the ministry, back in Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, Jesus says this, Hey, Simon, come follow me, and I will make you a fisher of men. I'm going to give you a purpose. Come follow me. Everybody say, follow me. And so Peter followed Jesus. And what's interesting about Peter is that he followed Jesus closely. He followed Jesus intimately. And when you follow Jesus closely, and you follow Jesus intimately, you're going to receive revelation Insight into the nature of who God is. And so that's what Simon did. He followed Jesus closely, and by following Jesus closely, he had a revelation of who God is, and in the midst of that, it changed his identity. And so this is Peter. He's following Jesus closely, and because he followed Jesus closely, he has a revelation, and he has this new identity. And he's saying, Man, that's right. I got my new identity. I'm Peter, I'm the rock. I'm the rock. I don't know what it fully means yet, but I'm the rock, and uh, I'm going to help him build his church. I don't know how it's going to happen. The gates of hell is not going to overcome it. I'm bold. I'm confident. I got the revelation of God. He changed my name. I'm going to go the distance with God. I'm so confident with God. I Man, I am going all the way with God. We're going to set up his kingdom on earth. I'm going to have accolades. I'm going to go ahead and reign and rule with Christ right here. It's going to be amazing. And that leads us to our main text today. Turn with me to about Mark chapter 14, verse 27. Mark chapter 14, starting in verse 27. It says this. Jesus says, you will all fall away. Jesus told them, it's written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead unto you to Galilee. Peter declared, everybody say, Peter declared. He declared, even if all fall away, I will not because I am the rock, baby. I have the revelation of who you are, and I know who I am. Who, who, I know what you say about me. And so, no, if all fall away, I want you to know I'm not going to fall away. And Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Today, yes, tonight, Peter, when the rooster crows two times, you yourself will disown me three times. Peter insisted emphatically. That means he's getting into an argument with Jesus about this. He insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never, ever, ever disown you. And all of the disciples said the exact same thing. Now, 
Jesus, we know the story, he gets arrested, right? And then they bring him to the high priest, and they, they go ahead and do a cross-examination trial on Jesus. And now we get to chapter, or, uh, sorry, chapter 14, but now go with me to verse 66. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself by the fire, she looked closely at him. You also were with, uh, sorry, you also were with that Nazarene Jesus, she said. But he denied it. I don't understand what you're talking about. And then he went out to the entryway. Verse 69, when the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, this fellow is with one, is with one of them, or he is one of them. Again, he denied it. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. And other translations uh, in the other gospel says your accent gives you away. So Peter now begins to call curses down on himself, and he swore, I don't know this man that you are talking about. Immediately the rooster crowed the second time. And he broke down and he wept. So Peter, the rock, the person who followed Jesus closely, intimately, the person who understood that, you know what, I'm in Christ, and now I am the rock, the person that followed Jesus so close and had the revelation of who God is, now ends up denying Christ, not just once, not just twice, he denies him three times. I believe that the number one reason why Peter denied Christ was because when the pressure of the culture was on him to conform, because the culture was denying Christ, the culture that, that, that Jesus was entering into, getting cross-examined by, that culture denied Christ. And when the culture was conforming Peter, he forgot his spiritual identity. He forgot his spiritual identity. And when you forget your spiritual identity, the temptation that this culture puts on you to mold you, to shape you, it's just too overwhelming. You're going to get molded. You're going to progressively get shaped into what the culture says about you, and they're going to try to plumb you up in line with the rest of the people. Culture has a way of influencing even the strongest of us in this room. In your heart, you may know the truth. I'm Peter. I'm the rock. In your heart, you may know the truth. I'm forgiven. I'm a child of God. I'm the righteousness of God. I am cleansed of all, my, uh, of all unrighteousness. I am called. I'm anointed. You might, ha you might know that truth in your heart. But the moment you feel like you're standing out in a culture that opposes all of those beliefs, you, like Peter will deny him and cave to the pressure every single time. And the reason why, if you're taking notes, the reason why we forget our spiritual identity is not because we're not following Jesus. Listen to me. It's how you're following Jesus. It is how you're following Jesus. If you are tripping up in this culture, it's not because in your heart you may not know the truth. It's not because you're not following Jesus. It is how you're following Jesus. When Peter was following Jesus closely and intimately, he had revelation. He had insight into the spiritual kingdom of God. But now, look at what Peter is doing. He forgot his spiritual identity because of how he was following Jesus. And the answer to how he was following Jesus is found right here in verse 54. In your Bible, you might want to circle it. You might want to underline it. You might want to put an asterisk by it. You might want to put a star by it because it's a warning sign that just like Peter was vulnerable in denying Jesus, it's no different with me and it's no different with you. How did Peter follow Jesus? Look at verse 54. Peter followed Jesus at a distance. Let that sink into your heart this morning. Peter followed Jesus at a distance. It says the same thing in Matthew. It says it right here in Mark. 
It says that in all the synoptic gospels, even in the book of Luke, he followed Jesus at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he sat with the guards, and he warmed himself up in the comfortable fire as he was very uncomfortable. He followed Jesus at a distance. How we follow Jesus in the year 2024 and beyond, it matters. It matters how you follow Jesus. Jesus, if you remember, he said, come follow me, and I will make you a fisher of men. He follows him closely. He's getting revelation into who God is. He had the revelation of who he is. And now, when the pressure of the culture is on him, he follows Jesus at a distance. I believe there are two groups of Christians, even in this room. I believe there are two groups of Christians. A Christian, some of you spiritual people in here, what does a Christian actually mean? Come on, some of you spiritual people. Nope. A Christian literally means a follower of Christ. And I believe there are two groups of Christians all over the world. Two groups of Christians. There are the ones who follow Christ closely and intimately. And there are those who follow Christ at a distance. And when we follow Jesus closely and intimately... You're going to get revelation into who God is. You're going to get fresh revelation into who the nature of he is. You're going to get fresh revelation and insight into who you are and what he declares you to be. You're going to get revelation and insight on how to live your life on this earth with a kingdom mindset. But when you follow him at a distance, we end up forgetting our identity, and that's when we end up denying Christ. You will deny Christ every single time if you forget that you're hidden in Christ. We deny him in so many different ways. When you forget your spiritual identity, that you're a child of God, that you're called, that you're the righteousness of God, that you're holy and blameless in his sight, that you're adopted, that you are seated with him in the heavenly places far above every spiritual principality or power on this earth that attacks your faith. When you forget all the things of who you are, the light of the world, the salt of this earth, you forget all of that stuff, you end up denying him in so many ways. You deny him in your behaviors. You deny him in your relationships. You deny him in the affections of your heart looking for the world to satisfy the ache within because you can't find satisfaction wherever you look. You deny him in your commitments. We deny him in our trust because we then become inward focused instead of upward focused in our worship. We become inward focused into a dark hole that's it's a bottomless pit of emotions trying to figure everything out to life's problems. We get clouded in our thinking because we're not upward focused. We deny him by doing the very thing that we said we would never do. If all fall away, Jesus, I never will fall away. Even if I have to die, I will never disown you. We end up denying him in doing the very thing that we said we would never, ever do again. And I like to propose to you, it's because we forgot our identity, because we follow Jesus at a distance. And when we follow Jesus at a distance, we become distant Christians. Distant Christians are not anchored in who they are. Distant Christians are not rooted in who they are. Distant Christians want the benefits of Christianity, but they will tap out if it gets uncomfortable and they will cozy up next to the fire of the culture. And so here are some of the tendencies of those who follow Jesus at a distance. Here are some of the tendencies. Number one, they tend to want the inside scoop. They want the information, but they don't want the sacrifice. They become spectators, but not players. They will show up, but not get involved. They tend to want the benefits of Christianity. They just don't want the association of Christianity when the pressure is on them to conform to what the world says is, that, is, is normal. They will conform to what work says they should do. They will conform to what politics say they should do. They will conform relationally. They will quietly do so without any type of a kickback because of the pressure of the culture when you forget your spiritual identity. They tend to deny Christ the moment they get mocked at, the moment they get scoffed at, the moment they get made fun of, ridiculed, or being narrow-minded, they will backtrack just like Peter, and they will say, that's not me. I'm not one of those Christians. 
I'm not one of those disciples. I'm not one of those 12 disciples. I don't even know that man that you're talking about. They will backpedal every single time because when you follow Jesus at a distance and you forget your identity and when you forget who God declares you to be, when you forget that you're forgiven of all your sins, when you forget that you're holy and blameless, when you forget that you're the righteousness of God, when you forget that you're more than an overcomer, when you forget that you're a co-heir with Christ, when you forget that you're a citizen in heaven, when you forget that you're an ambassador of Christ, when you forget all of these things of who you are in Christ, you will conform to the ways of this world. So how do we become Christians that don't so easily forget our identity? Because even though Peter denied Christ three times, how do the angels in heaven still view him? As a rock. Even though you deny him in so many different ways in your life, relationally, maybe even in your marriage, maybe within your workplace, wherever, maybe it's with friends, how Jesus sees you is still not how you see yourself. You are still in Christ. Even when you're out there sinning, if you truly believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sin, you are still hidden in Christ. The problem is you're not acting the way heaven sees you. And so there's three ways on how not to forget our identity. And I pray that you take notes. I've been serving the Lord for many years, many years. I mean, I was crying out to the Lord when I was four years old. I didn't know how to follow him because I didn't know my identity until I was about 21 years old. But I want to tell you, throughout all of life's issues and throughout all of life's problems, everything comes back down to your identity in Christ. And it might be the basic elementary teaching but I'm telling you, it's so foundational and life transformational that if you get these concepts in your heart, you are getting set up for a life of success if you can partner with what God declares you to be according to not what the pastor says, according to what the word of God says. Three ways on how not to forget your identity if you're taking notes. Number one, we need to develop a deeper prayer life. We need to develop a deeper prayer life. It's not about just praying throughout the day. I venture to say a lot of people in here, me included, we pray continually, almost without ceasing throughout the day. How many of you guys like talking to yourselves in the car? <laughs> you guys have all these conversations with yourself in the car, and you invite God into those conversations, and you talk to God all the time throughout the day. You talk to him maybe before dinner time, you might say a little prayer. You talk to God, but I'm talking about secluded times away with God, where it's just you on your face seeking him in developing a deeper, enriching prayer life. We gotta develop a prayer life. This includes following, <laughs> this includes following the promptings of God to pray when you don't feel like it. How many guys wanna develop a deeper prayer life? Raise your hand. Of course, of course. How many of you guys want to develop a deeper prayer life when you don't feel like it? Oh, don't raise your hand. I believe Peter's outcome would have been entirely different if he followed the promptings of God when he was too tired to pray. Had Peter been in prayer, the outcome could have been different. I know scripture had to be fulfilled, but the outcome could have been different. The reason why Peter followed Christ at a distance, forgot his identity, denied Christ three times, is because he didn't follow the promptings of God when God called him to pray. That leads us to Mark, look at with me in verse 37. Mark chapter 14, verse 37. Three times he denied Christ because three times he didn't follow the promptings of God to pray. Three times he followed Christ at a distance because three times he denied the promptings of the Holy Spirit or of Jesus telling him to pray. Look at with me in verse 37. You guys following along this morning? Yeah. All right, here we go. Then he returned to his disciples and he found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch with me for one hour. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Your spirit's willing, 
but your body and your flesh, it's so weak. Once more, he went away, and he prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. So three times, Peter denies Christ because three times he failed at following the promptings of God to pray when he felt tired. But he wasn't too tired to follow Jesus at a distance. He wasn't too tired to follow Jesus right up to the, court, uh, to the inner courts. He wasn't too tired to go the distance with Christ at a distance. He just couldn't have the confidence to do it intimately and up close. So three times he disobeys Christ because three times he didn't follow the promptings of God to go deeper in his prayer life. And I believe that the reason why we follow Jesus so much at a distance and we forget who we are in Christ is because we have allowed tiredness to rob us of our prayer life. He prompts your heart in the evening. Come spend some time with me. Oh, I'm just too tired. I'll do it in the morning. But you know, as do I, the moment you wake up in the morning, you're still going to be too, you're going to be too tired. So then you say, I'll do it in the evening time. Or I'll pray throughout work. I'll pray throughout the day. I'll follow Jesus at a distance. But up close and personally, on my face before God, just really seeking him, just for the beauty of who he is, for the majesty of who he is, for the glory of who he is, just to know him more, that kind of prayer life, yeah, I'd just rather do it at a distance. God, just help me get through today. There's nothing wrong with that. But Jesus is calling us to go deeper in our prayer life he causes us, he prompts us to pray in the evening. We push it off. We had a long day. I'm tired. The kids are crying. It was just a long day at work. I'll do it in the morning. Oh, I'm still too tired in the morning. I got to hit the door and run. It's just, a, it's just a battle to get out of my house and get in the car and get to work on time. Or the kids dropped off in school on time. And so we follow him at a distance. And then we forget our identity. But number two, not only should we develop a deeper prayer life, let me tell you, God is really challenging some of you guys to go deep in prayer. He is challenging some of you guys to go deeper in prayer. I think when you get to the end of the life, in your life, and you watch the videotape of your entire life, and you see all the, the shortcomings in your life, where, and Jesus is faithful. He's going to see you to the end. All right? How many guys know God's faithful? He who started the good work in you, he is faithful to complete that which he started in you. But when you watch the videotape of your whole life and you see all the areas and the seasons of your life where it was just really hard or where you went off course and then he had to bring you back, I believe if you watch your life before you went off course, you would have noticed my prayer life was not that good. I was still praying, but I wasn't close with God in prayer. If you don't want to forget your identity... In Christ, you need to develop a deeper prayer life. Number two, number two, if you're taking notes. In prayer, we should declare our love for God. In prayer, we should declare our love for God. Jesus, we all know the story. Peter denies Christ. Jesus is then crucified on the cross, dies for the sins of the world. He's risen now from the dead, and now he encounters Peter once again. Turn with me to John chapter 21 in your Bible. John chapter 21, and follow along with me in verse 15. It says this, When they had finished eating, after Jesus rose from the dead, Jesus encountered Simon Peter. Simon, son of John, Notice he calls him Simon here. Son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said to Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep then. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter now was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. 
I have affections in my heart towards you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. And then notice this, at the very end, then he said to him, follow me. Follow me. Peter started off his ministry. In the very beginning, Jesus says, come, follow me. He follows Jesus really closely. He gets the revelation of who God is, and he gets the revelation of who he is. Then when the pressure comes, he doesn't follow the promptings of the Holy Spirit to pray and go deep at the, at the hour of temptation. So now Peter follows Jesus. He's still following him. He's following at a distance, forgets his identity, denies Christ three times, and now Jesus declares unto him, do you love me three times? Gives Peter the opportunity to declare his love back to him three times. It's as if every time Peter declares his love to God, it's like it erases one denial. In our prayer life, it would be wise to declare our love for God and the affections of our heart towards him, even if you do not have the boldness to do it. As you confess your love for God, it starts renewing your mind in the love of God, which indirectly trains you to follow him closely throughout the day. How many of us go to the Lord and just go, Father... I just thank you for who you are. I thank you for the beauty of who you are. You're glorious. You're majestic. You're holy. You're righteous. You're so lovely. You're altogether wonderful. Thank you for your, the forgiveness of sins and the beauty of who you are. And Father, I just want to say I thank you. I love you. I love you for who you are. I declare my love to you. Men, it's okay. Be bold. Be dominant. Be courageous. God, I declare that I love you. Even though he, the enemy comes and he starts accusing you, you don't really love God because you're still following him at a distance. You know it, blah, blah, blah. That's the accuser talking to you. And you just go, I declare my love for you. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Therefore, I am, in declaring my love to God out loud, what am I doing? I'm setting myself up to obey the great commandment. And the great commandment was to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And when you declare, God, I love you. I love you more than my family. I love you more than my very life. I love you more than the air I breathe. I love you for who you are. You created me in my mother's womb. I don't just love you for all the aspects and the wonderful things that you do. I love you for who you are. I want intimacy with you, God. I want to follow you. I wanted the revelation of who you are to change my life so I have the revelation of who I am in Christ forgiven. Amen? Give him praise. Now notice, Jesus also says to him three times, feed my sheep. This is symbolic language for feeding my people with the words of life. The best way to know God, to love him, is by renewing our mind in God's word, and that leads to the final point on how not to forget your identity in Christ. And that's this. In prayer, we need to regularly renew our minds in what God's word says about us in prayer. So we need to deepen our prayer life, follow the promptings of God when we're too tired, and I get it, I'm all tired too, and I'm not perfect at this either. But number two, we declare our love to God in prayer, and then number three, we gotta renew our minds in prayer. Romans 12, verse two, this will be the last verse of today, says, do not conform to the patterns of this world, system, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his perfect and pleasing will. You want to understand God's will for your life? We have to renew our mind in what God's word declares us to be. To be conformed. It says, do not be conformed to the ways of this world. To be conformed is what was happening to Simon when he denied Christ. He was being conformed to a world that denied him. He was being conformed. Conformed is like a potter molding clay on the outside. They're conforming it to an image. They're conforming it to a pattern. And how many of you guys know this world wants to conform you 
The politics of this world wants to conform you to think this way, to behave this way. The educational systems, they're wanting to, they're wanting to conform the parents and the children to think like this, to operate like this. Uh, the world values are wanting to conform you and shape you to be like that of the world. Disney is wanting to conform you and and mold you and to shape you into its image. The world system is controlled by the enemy who wants to get his hands on the systems of this world to conform you from the outside to think like this, to act like this, to behave like this, to not have this viewpoint or this viewpoint. Don't go to Jesus. That's too radical. That's too outside. You got to think this way. And just like Peter, he buckled underneath the pressure. So will we if we forget our spiritual identity. But the Bible says we're to be transformed on the inside. Being conformed and transformed is two totally opposite things. Conformed is from pressure on the outside. It's the pressure of the school district on you. It's the pressure of work on you. It's the pressure of family on you. It's the pressure of unbelievers on you. It's the pressure of music on you. It's the pressure of the entertainment world on you. It's the pressure of the sports on you. Think this way, be like this. Do It's from the outside. But being transformed comes from the inside. The Greek word is metamorphosis. It's, it's from the transformation of a caterpillar to a butterfly. And Jesus is saying this, you get transformed by renewing your mind. You gotta renew your mind in what God declares you to be. And God, like I said, he declares you to be set free. You are a doer of God's word, not just a hearer. You're a disciple of Jesus. It's who you are. You are God's workmanship, created in Christ to do good works. You're a minister of reconciliation. You are a light of the world. You're the co-heir of Christ. You were born again. You're not of this world. You're not a slave to fear. You are more than a conqueror. You're seated with Christ in the heavenly places. You were called. You were chosen. You were forgiven. This is who you are in Christ. You're a son of God. You're a daughter of God. This is who you are in Christ. And so we got to renew our mind in prayer. God wants us to be a church. And we said it before we started. Our church is all about growing healthy lives. The number one way on how we do that here, we're going to be a church that pursues God. We pursue him in prayer. We go deep with God in our prayer life. And maybe a lot of us may be in here, including myself. We fumble, we jumble. That's all right, because this is not going to be a church that's filled with shame or condemnation. We are a radiant church. And those who look to him are radiant. Amen? If you agree with it, can you say amen? amen. Let's all stand.